It's our nature, our sinful nature, to hide and conceal and even deceive to keep others from seeing what we consider our own weaknesses. We hide our flaws and failures and weaknesses, and this hiding is so common among mankind, it might be even universal. Universal means every human being does it. I mean, it may be a universal thing for us to hide our weaknesses, to keep others from seeing what's inside us. And it's clearly an instinctive function of the human soul. Concealing what we consider our failures, flaws, and lesser characteristics finds its root in fear of what others might think. We are really, really tied into what others might think. And I've found that those who say most adamantly, I don't care what others think, are those who care the most what others think. But we'll see. I mean, it's all a personal issue between you and the Lord. Now, whenever I discuss things like this, I talked with a person, a believer the other day about this particular issue, and this person immediately jumped. You know, I want to see if your mind has jumped to this place. You mean I'm supposed to stand up in front of everybody and reveal what's in my soul? I said, where did you get the idea of standing up? In front? I mean, where did that come from? Where did that come from? We tend to do that as well. We tend to jump to the opposite extreme. Well, the guy said, I know there's a middle ground because I see it every time I swing past it. You know, go <laughs> from one extreme to the other. Yeah. Yeah. So we conceal what we consider our lesser characteristics, and this is our fear of what others think. And this fear shows itself by the, ma by the fabrication, the development over time of a mask. The mask, which is a defense mechanism to show the best and hide the rest. We show the best and hide the rest. Larry Crabb, Dr. Larry Crabb, one of my favorite writers, describes this as the sin of self-protection, where our, where our primary goal, and ask yourself if this is from the Lord, is to protect ourselves from people seeing what's less about us people seeing what we don't want them to see. So we develop a mask. The Bible's full of examples of believers who were commanded to examine themselves, to lay aside this mask that they might live genuine, transparent lives, but we hide our hearts instead. Now, if you'll turn to Genesis 3 with me, we'll see a good example of this. I mean, right out of the gate, of the sin nature, the development of the sin nature, we see Adam and Eve doing this very thing. So after they ate the fruit, Adam and Eve immediately realized they were naked or naked, surrendered to fear of exposure fabricated coverings and hid themselves from the presence of God in the garden. Let's read Genesis 3, 7 through 10. It's on your page as well as in your Bible. It says, Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. The Lord called out and said, where are you? Now, did the Lord know where they were? Okay. He said, and, and the man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Now, this nakedness is not only physical nakedness, but a psychological, emotional nakedness. There's a lot of ways of thinking about this and looking at this, and we want to kind of introduce the idea of covering ourselves 
emotionally and psychologically so that others can't see all of the struggles within. Uh, but that's what's going on here. Now, it says their eyes were open, meaning they knew right from wrong. You know, in innocence, they didn't need to know right from wrong. The only right from wrong was the fruit of the tree. One issue. Everything else is right. Eating from this tree is wrong. That was it. That's all they needed to know. You know, a lot of times we're curious about a lot of things that we don't really need to know about. It doesn't help us or anyone else to know. I've heard a lot of gossip that f fell into that category. Well, tell me what happened. Yeah, like we need to know. You know, we've got a press in this country that thinks that it is the right of all the people to know every last detail of a person's life. And that's simply not true. That is just not true. The people want to know. Well, yeah, the people are sinful gossipers. They sure do want to know. But we see Adam and Eve ashamed to be exposed for their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves up. What we see here is the first religion. We see man has a spiritual problem and has initiated action to fix it himself. They're going to fix this himself. Now, I'm really amazed. And I think once you see what they could have done, perhaps you'll be amazed as well. They covered up their problems. Look, they hid from each other. They covered themselves up where they'd been wide open, you know, fully, fully functional with each other. Nothing to hide, nothing to be fearful about, nothing to be ashamed of. All of a sudden, they've got to cover everything up. And there's got to, they've got to make distance between one another. Listen, sin always causes distance in intimate relationships. Always. And if you want to know what's causing the distance in your intimate relationship, then you can, you can trace it all the way back to some area of wrong thinking connected to something you want or don't want or disappointment, hurt, anger, something along those lines has led to bitterness and now there's a separation. So, and listen, listen, when we're not going to look at that, but when God asked him, what's going on here? You know who he blamed? He blamed two people, but mainly he blamed God. This woman you gave me. Dear Sylvia, I asked Sylvia one time why women didn't like to be wrong or apologize. She, she told me just to love. She said, you don't need to know, just love. That was wise. But she came back a month later and said, I think we got blamed from the beginning for everything. And we've been on the defensive ever since. <laughs> That's pretty smart there. That's pretty smart. I sure miss that lady. So, rather than face the truth about themselves, they preferred to hide their self from their self and from others. Rather than look at the truth... And let it be open, they hid it. Now there's a logic to that, and it's really, really kooky logic, but we're going to look at it. If we can successfully deceive others about our own worthiness or righteousness, we feel satisfied. Listen, if, if we can convince others that we're cool, we're right on, or whatever the term is for the day, uh, then we think we are. We think we are. Because the goal for us being people worshipers, people dependent rather than God dependent, is to get the people thinking that we're what we ought to be 
And if we can get that to happen, if everybody loves us and likes us and thinks we're okay, approves of us, we think we got it made. We think that's the goal. And it's not. So we hide the, uh, what, how did I say that? So we show the best and hide the rest. We show the best, put our best foot forward and hide the rest. Now, this is the story of marriage. I don't know how many marriage I've done. I'm, I'm well over the hundreds now in marriage counseling, hundreds of them. And every one of them says, I thought that you were different. I thought he was different. You know, this is not who I wanted to marry. This is, I thought you were different. Well, we, we show the best and hide the rest. Hello. Now, God requires, instead of hiding, that we face the root problems in our life and resolve them with truth, pretending about nothing. Here's God's plan. Let's see, man's plan is to show the best and hide the rest. God's plan is to show it all and deal with the problems and straighten it out. Throw away what's wrong, adopt what's right. Open the system up. Open this thing up. Most people's, if you thought of your soul as an engine, most people's souls are running on, instead of eight cylinders, running on five and a half. Just chugging and smoking and, but they keep on going. I love hearing these cars that look good on the outside, but when they crank them up, you know, they, ju -ju -ju -ju, they chug. That's us. So they hid from God and said, I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he says, who told you you were naked? In innocence, naked was not, was not an issue. The goal of spiritual growth, the application for us, is to regain the capacity for absolute truth and fearless transparency. Listen, there is nothing wrong or inadequate about you that is, does not apply to every other human being. Every bit of what's wrong with any of us comes from Adam and Adam's sin that has come to the human race, and every bit of it is common to all of us. It just looks different in different people. The same problems, the same sense of inadequacy, the same needs, the same hunger, the same feeling of disappointment where nobody gets loved the way they want to be loved in this life, Except for God, of course, we don't, we, listen, we know God loves us. And those of us who were mature enough wished to high heaven that we could make him and his love all we needed. My great goal is to let God's love for me be all that my heart wants. And then be grateful for whatever else I get. But I still find myself hungry, demandingly hungry for the love of other people, for the recognition and love of other people. And I wish that I could grow beyond that, and I am seeking to do so, struggling hard in the plan of God to grow beyond that so that God is all I need. But that's the goal. And yet... If you're honest with yourself, you realize, I'm not there. I'm not there. And, and listen, you're not, you're not open about that. We hide these things. We act like everything's cool. We got it down. And yet inside, we know we don't. We hide it. Listen, wouldn't it be interesting if just uh, God would provide just a f small group of people in your life with whom you could just be real and honest and then they would say, well, boy, I got the same thing. I got the same problem. 
How are you dealing with it? Well, I'm, you know, I'm going to the Lord of this. I'm using this principle. I'm using this promise. You know, I've been trying that. I've been thinking about that. The Spirit's been leading me to that. See, that's called fellowship. That's called spiritually helping and nurturing one another. So we want to gain, regain the capacity to be absolutely truthful about ourselves and be transparent. You see, prior to their sin, they had no need to even know about nakedness. Now, the work of the cross has eliminated the penalty for sin and the need to be ashamed of any specific area of weakness. Listen, whatever area of weakness that you have, whatever ever makes you feel inadequate, inferior, that's real and not imagined, the cross dealt with it, wiped it out. There is no reason for us to feel inadequate or inferior or ashamed or fearful about anything that's going on inside of us. Because no matter what it is, it's just like the rest of us. It's just like the rest of us. Some people are, have lent themselves to the spiritual life and have gone farther down the road of maturity. Their goal is to turn around and help those coming behind while they keep going. There are those that are more mature. You need to look for those and say, hey, can you help? And that is, listen, that is if your goals are spiritual. Perhaps you're still at a phase of your life where your goals are really still earthly. And your, your goal with God is to get God to bless your earthly life. You know, long life and good health and all wonderful things, but they can't be first things. Now, normal logic, if you read down at the bottom of this little section here, normal logic would expect Adam and Eve to run to God, asking for help confessing their sin, open to whatever God wanted them to do. I mean, look, here everything is great and wonderful. Except, listen, except Eve had become dissatisfied with her life. She became dissatisfied. And apparently she'd been fussing at her husband about it because he'd become very passive, very passive. And that's what happens when a wife begins to berate her husband and complain to him, he feels like he's supposed to fix it and make life better. You know, a husband's desire is for his wife to be happy. So his number one thing in life is if I can make this woman happy. Well, good luck with that. Because, not because she's a woman, because nobody can make anybody else happy. You got to get it from the Lord. But... You can see that something's been going on because when he, it says he was there with her listening to this whole thing from the snake, the devil, and he never said a word, never interfered, watched her eat the thing, and then she turned and gave it to him, and he just went right along with it. He's gone passive. He's no longer leading. He's no longer protecting. He's simply trying to remain included. He's afraid somehow she's going to leave or, lo or he's going to lose her, whatever. But you would think once they ate this and realized what had happened, and I don't think they really understood what happened. I don't think they understood the significance of what they had done. Of course, when they got kicked out of the garden, and, and as Eve said, that we had to move. Uh, God made a move. Uh, but they really understood when Cain killed Abel. When they couldn't find Abel and they realized that he was dead, that, he, that their, other, their oldest had killed the next one, that's when they went, wow, what have we done? But you would expect them to run to God and ask for help, confessing sin. Father, what do we do? Lord, what do we do? And whatever you say, I will do to regain my righteous standing before you. 
But instead, they take this unbearable burden on themselves. They try to resolve their spiritual death through sewing fig leaves together or leaves of some kind, wearing them, hiding, covering up. Somehow they're going to cover up and God's not going to know. Listen, this is the basis of all religion. There's a, there's a spiritual problem and man does something to fix it thinking that God is going to be tricked or fooled or satiated or pleased by what you do. God is never pleased by what we do. You can't, you can't satisfy the justice of God by what you do. So, the instinct or the reflex to protect oneself by concealing flaws, weaknesses, has passed to the whole human race. Romans 5.12. It's evidenced by Peter in his refusal to believe Jesus about the three denials. Now, had we time, we could go through many, many different examples of people that were deceitful, deceitful and, and hid their weaknesses and hid their plans and they had machinations and all kinds of things going on in, that they didn't share with other people. We could look at Jacob and the way he deceived everybody. You know, we could look at David. All kinds of examples in the Bible of people that fall into this category of hiding. And I hope that you've been able, just in this little time, to be able to relate to this idea and see this in yourself. I hope you can see Peter. Now, if you look on your page or turn to Matthew 26, starting with verse 31, either way, if you want to look at it in your Bible, make some notes. They're in the upper room, and Jesus is telling them what's about to happen. He's preparing them. And I love Matthew's account. He gives the, the most account for it of the, of the interaction. And he says, Tonight you will all fall away because of me. For it is written, now this is an Old Testament prophecy, messianic prophecy. I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Now this is Zechariah 13, 7 through 9. This is an Old Testament prophecy that Peter has grown up with and knows is absolutely inerrant. He knows this is the word of God and the will of God. This is from the Bible, from the scriptures, right? Does Peter have a high view of the scriptures? I mean, apparently everything he believes about Jesus at this point has come from the scriptures. Of course, they, they didn't understand yet what he was really doing. But he says, you're all going to fall away from me tonight because of this prophecy. This prophecy makes it sure. Peter said, uh, then he says, but after I have been raised or resurrected, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said, even though everyone else may fall away, I don't care what the prophecy says. I will never fall away. Now, Peter is stronger than prophecy. Lord, I don't care that you've prophesied the rapture. I'm not going. Everybody else is going to go up with the rapture, but I'm, I'm going to hang on right here. Does that make sense to you? Jesus then said to him and said, Truly I say to you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. Now that's pretty humorous to me. But Peter has just now, he has, look, he has rejected the word, the prophetic word 
of Zechariah, and he has rejected the prophetic word of Jesus Christ. Now, what's up with Peter? What's up with him? Jesus has told him that the weakness that's truly inside of him is about to be exposed. This night, you're going to see how fearful you really are. And when the authorities come, you're all going to run because you're afraid. And nobody's angry with you about it. Nobody's upset about it. But Peter is, is determined that he not be seen in that light. Peter has an image that he's trying to portray of strength, of loyalty, of, of uh, I'm unbreakable. My loyalty and love for you, Lord, is so great, I'm a, nothing can cause me to run. Are you kidding me? And deny that I know you? Now, do you think Peter believed that he could do that? I do. I think, I think Peter was sincere. I think he was generally saying no matter what. And he thought no matter what, he would be able to do it. Listen, he didn't even know how weak he was himself. He wasn't just pretending for everyone else. He was pretending for himself. And this is what you find as you look at yourself and look at your soul for transformation as you discover that there's much about yourself you don't even know yourself. You're not even aware of. There's all different kinds of ways that we've deceived ourselves and created this image to protect ourselves that we don't, we're not even aware that we're doing that. In fact, this mass that we create, we think we are that. Now, Peter certainly does. So, Jesus said, you're going to fall away, Zechariah 13, this messianic prophecy written approximately 550 years prior. Peter hears this biblical prophecy but decides that his human will and ability is more powerful. So he, and then he hears Jesus prophesy about that very night and he rejects the word of the prophet and of Jesus. Then, he says, after I have been resurrected, what is it they believed that Jesus was going to do? What was he there to do? Yes, save them from Rome and establish the millennial kingdom. That was the only thing the Old Testament had given them as far as what he would do when he came. The, the, the death, burial, and resurrection was a mystery. They didn't know, really understand. But had he been telling them? Way back in Matthew 16, 10 chapters ago from here, he started telling them, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be, I'm going to be killed by the priest, the chief priest, and then I've got to be resurrected. Just like Jonah. He's been telling them. Well, they can't, they can't let go of this idea that he is there to establish the kingdom. Even after the resurrection, when he's ascending in Acts chapter 1, they're still asking him about the kingdom. The kingdom. They couldn't get it out of their heads. This was the, the Jewish mindset about what Messiah would do. This is possibly, this is part of why today those that we call Jews don't accept him. He didn't do what their Bible, their Old Testament, said he was going to do. But he fulfilled all the prophecies, which is how you persuade them. But he says, after I've been resurrected, which was a, which was, listen, this was code to say, guys, listen, I'm not here to do that. I'm going to die. I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to die, but never fear. Don't be afraid of that because three days and three nights later, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Now, they, they obviously had trouble believing this, right? You agree with that? Let me tell you. 
they held to this previous belief. They kept believing the, the initial belief of him coming and establishing the kingdom. When you hold on to one belief, you can't buy into another. Listen, you can't believe two things about the same issue at the same time. I mean, either I, I'm seven foot one. Do I look seven foot one? Now, I'm seven foot one this way. I'm getting there. I'm working on it hard. But look, I could tell you I'm seven foot one, but you know it's not true. But somebody out there might believe, yeah, he's, he, somebody heard it on uh, audio and didn't see the video. They say, that guy, Al, he's seven foot one. And as long as you hold to one idea, you can't accept another. This is why we have all this Bible doctrine in the left lobe or even in the right lobe that's never, it's not usable in your life. It's not usable. Because you've held on to your previous beliefs about how life works or a previous teaching about how life works and these things that are here waiting to be utilized. They can't get into your heart. They can't get into the launching pad area to be used because you've got something already there that has to be removed. Nothing new. But this is the same for them. They, they won't let that go, and therefore they can't believe. I mean, what is this resurrection thing? I mean... You have to die to be resurrected, and you can't bring in the kingdom if you're going to die. So, here's Peter. Even if everyone else falls, I will never. And in other words, I'm stronger than all the rest of you, even prophecy. He is committed to maintaining this mask of strength and loyalty, of fearlessness, no matter who says what. No matter who says what. You know, you see this, people get accused of things in the media. I saw a thing this morning about Bill Cosby. Well, I mean, by the time you get 50 different people saying the same thing, it's really difficult. And as much as you might have admired this guy before, it's difficult to not give credibility to this. I mean I, I mean, I really loved hearing the guy. I mean, way back when I was a kid, I listened, used to listen to his uh, uh, LP, you know, the records. Funniest guy I ever heard. But apparently you don't want him as a babysitter. But who knows? Who knows? This Bill O'Reilly thing that, that you know, uh, that they just, you know, who knows? I certainly don't. But when people are accused true or not, they're going to maintain a uh, mask of innocence. He says, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. I'll die with you, but I'll never deny you. They all had constructed a mask of bravery and loyalty they believed about their self. I mean, do you believe that about yourself? If you got captured and tortured to deny your faith. This has happened all through history. Don't think it won't happen here. And people say you can be released if you simply deny Jesus Christ. You think you have the gumption? Well, listen, you better be mature. You better be spiritually mature because your human ability and human loyalty won't cut it. There will come a point when your inner dialogue will begin to say, this is kind of stupid. This is kind of stupid. You know, I'll just confess it. So, they were all committed. Listen, listen to this. They were all committed to appear like. You hear that? To appear like. I see these big old churches full of people on Sunday morning 
If you go visit and you look at their doctrinal statement and you look at what they feed their people, I've learned not to be critical of others, but it's, it's doctrine light at, at the very best. So, did Peter even know who and what he really was behind the mask? Did he really know that he would cut and run? Did he know that? I don't, I don't think he did. Now, let's, let's just get a few ideas and then we'll take a break. God's essence and his plan operate totally on truth with nothing false, either his essence or his plan. There's nothing false in the plan of God. There's no pretending. No pretending. If something is, it is. It is what it is. And if you have an area of sin or weakness that you've yet to address with the Lord and you see it within yourself and yet you've, you've not dealt with it, you've not approached it, you've not given it to him, but you've hidden it, you've covered it up, you've just held it away so that I'm just going <laughs> to, you know, I'm, such and, I'm so far along in this human life deal, I'm just going to coast on out of here. Listen, I don't blame you for that. I was talking to a lady one time, and she said, I'm 70 years old. You think I should start digging into this? I said, that's got to be up to you, but if I was 70, I may not do that. You know, I may just enjoy the blessings of the Lord, and, but I knew, she said, you know that's not true. Of course it's not true. If No matter what age you are, when, you, when the Lord reveals to you, I want you to take a look within would Paul call it examine yourself? Examine to see if you're in the faith. Examine to yourself to see if you're spiritual. Examine to see what's going on inside of yourself. What's the logic? What's the, what's the inner dialogue? What is the motivation behind what you do? We are, we are He commands and demands that we do that. There's not an option here, except we've been given the freedom to go as far with God as we choose to go. He doesn't make us. He doesn't make us. He allows us. God is light, i.e. truth, and in him is no darkness at all. When you deal with God, you deal with God in absolute truth. Now, listen, God is glad to listen to us when we come and pretend with him. He, he'll accept us. I loved it. I've always loved it when my children pretended, except when they got grown and pretended about why the car was crashed. I didn't really like that so much, but man, secondly, man's corrupted nature, his sin nature operates on lies False ideas and deceptions. In 2 Corinthians 4, 2 and 4, he talks about how the minds of the unbelievers have been blinded to be unable to see the light of the gospel. It's not only in salvation, but it's for the spiritual life. Our minds have been blinded by, listen, by previous ideas we have believed and continue to believe and continue to see in our mind so that when somebody gives you the truth, you can't see it. You can't accept it. You're holding on with all your might to what you've already believed. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, we're born spiritually dead and dominated by the devil. 1 Corinthians 2.14, incapable of relating to God or understanding the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, we're spiritually blind. In Romans 8.7, we're incapable of obeying God. In John 3.19 and 20, it says we love darkness rather than light. This is the sin nature. Man under the influence of the sin nature instinctively avoids the truth and prefers to hide behind pretense. We prefer to put up the mask and hide behind the pretense. Mm -hmm. 
man under the sin nature gauges his worthiness based on the opinion of others, of other people. If you read this 2 Corinthians 10, you'll see Paul talks about those who compare themselves with themselves. How do you know you're okay? Well, I compared myself with so-and-so. It's natural to do that. Listen, it's sin natural. What is spiritually natural is to compare yourself with Jesus Christ. He's the one we compare with to see where we really are. When you compare with some other human being, I don't care who they are. You don't get a true read. You get a pretense read. You get a fake read. It's fake news. You get fake news. Man under the sin nature strives to create the appearance of that he might persuade others of his success. In other words, success is determined by how it looks to others. Thirdly, the new man in Christ loves the light and the truth because it frees him from the slavery, A, to the fear of death, B, to the fear of punishment from God, and C, fear of what other people think. In John 8, 32, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and it will set you free. And we could go on, but he, you see, in the spiritual life, the heart can't hold two opposing views at the same time. One must go and the other must grow. So we hear doctrine from the Bible, the truth, and we know that it's true. The Spirit gives us an assurance of the truth of it, but we say there's no way that I could actually live up to that right now. I mean, what is it that you know to be true from the Word of God that you say right now, I know I'm not capable of living up to that? If this were to happen, and I were to be called upon to, to think this way and feel this way and act this way, live this way, I know that I would fall short. What is it in your life? And the question is, all right, why is that? Why is that? Why is it that you've not turned and faced that in your life and taken that on with the word and the truth and the relationship with God and allowed God to open that up in your soul and deal with it and fix it so that you are now able to apply in that area of your life. Why do we not? And I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. Why do I refuse to face things? And then I cover it up and pretend like I have. Hmm, that didn't sound good, did it? I don't hear screaming. Now, the heart can't hold two views at the same time. Can't do it. So if one of your views in about an area of life is false, you're not going to be able to take the truth and put it in, the, in that place until you remove it. So we must reject those initial fleshly, worldly beliefs before we are able to actually use new man ideas. We have to remove the, new, the old man idea before we can re actually, listen, you can learn it and know it and know that it's true, yet you're not capable of utilizing it in your life. Every time that circumstance comes at you, you fall apart. Every time the relationship comes to that place, you, ups, you get upset. You still haven't let go of this wrong idea about how to deal with it so that you can accept the concept of love. God says, no matter what he does or she does, edify. Watch. Edify. Right? Edify. And yet, 
in certain areas of our life. Look, certain areas we've got that down. We've grown to that point that no matter what happens, I'm stable. I stay relaxed. An RMA. I stay cool. I'm able to let God handle it. But you get over here in this other area, and I bristle. I'm ready to fight. Right? And the point I'm trying to make is that rather than be open and honest and say, I need some help, once it's over, I cover it back up and pretend with myself that somehow it's okay. When in reality, God has just revealed to you because you failed, he has just revealed to you, we got to work on this. we got to work on this. So, believers must reject and remove false beliefs from the soul, the subconscious. Let me tell you what the subconscious is, and then we'll close. People have, listen, psychology, in order to, you do realize I'm a psychologist. I mean, I got the, I got the degrees and all that stuff. The psychologist, in, the, in their attempt to elevate their field so that they can make more money and compete, they want to become a medical part of the medical field. And legitimately, they are. But the medical field doesn't think that way about them. The medical field thinks they're witch doctors, they're, they're kooks. And so what they've done is they've taken these concepts like the subconscious and they've made them mysterious. And they've created all these terms. They've borrowed all these Greek terms and created all this terminology that you're like, I have no idea what you're... So they've, they've made it difficult to understand. Watch. It's very simple. You go through some experience today. And based on that experience, you reach a conclusion about why it happened, what it was all about, what it meant, what it meant to you, what it meant about the other people involved, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of different things, and you come to a conclusion about that, and you believe the conclusion. Okay? You with me? Pretty simple stuff we do every day. Well, you take that conclusion that has now become a belief, and you use it in your life. And the next time you see that person, listen, this can be a positive thing or a negative thing. The next time you see that person, you, you reference that event and that conclusion that you believed. And you go, oh, wait, it's good to see you again. Oh, great, it's good to see you again. And for the short term, when you use your belief, maybe you went through some really positive thing and you have decided that this person is great and wonderful and all that. That's your belief about this person. They're just a wonderful person. So every time you see them, it's like, all oh, right, great. Well, short term, every time you see them, you reference that event. And you remember what you believed. But a month later when you see them, you don't reference that event and remember. You Look, you just think positive of them. You feel positive, Right? Six months down the road, you don't go back through the whole thing. What's happened <clears throat> is that belief has become a habit. It's just become a habit of thinking that way about this person. You follow that? Listen, every time you see this person, you don't have to stop and go back through everything you've ever experienced with them to go, oh, wait, 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 oh, yeah, okay. I'm supposed to think positive about you. You just do. You follow that? Well, here's what's happened. You've adopted an idea, believed it to be true, used it in your life, habituated it, and now it's become part of the layer in your life of your thinking. You forgot all the reasons why you ever thought that about the person, and now when you see them, you automatically like them. It became a habit. And so 10 years down the road, somebody says, well, why do you like so-and-so so much? You're like, I don't really know. You know, I don't really know. You've forgotten where it all started, and 
Look, that's the subconscious. It's just layer after layer after layer of beliefs that you adopted and used and forgot about, turned it into a habit, and now it just runs automatically. Under the surface, it just runs automatically. Works for the good stuff, the bad stuff, spiritual stuff, sinful stuff, just how it works. Everything works on habits. Everything's a habit. When you understand that everything's a habit, then you can begin to make progress in changing things. That's why it's so difficult to overcome something in your life that's a deeply ingrained habit. You have to be persistent until you win. But our tendency is to hide our problems. And I'm not talking about from each other. We definitely do that. But even from God, even from God. Let's be honest and let's be open. If you're ever going to grow, you're going to have to face up to the truth. Let's have a prayer and then we'll have an offering. Father, what a great privilege. I pray that these things could be understood, entertained, and believed for application. Whatever is in the way, Father, that might hinder us from believing and applying this, I pray that you would reveal it to us, expose us, and enable us to remove it. I pray for the offering that what we give, Father, will be multiplied many times for the sake of the kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.